Omar. Assalamualaikum, Syekh Omar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi How are you doing? Good, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, nice to see you again uh, after a while. Yes. Uh, and now you are in the States. Uh, hopefully you are doing fine over there. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Alhamdulillah. You know, dunia is dunia, no matter where you are. <laughs> yeah, Alhamdulillah. So uh, this is your, your office or your house? Uh, both. This is my both. office slash house. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, Shah Omar, uh, uh, right now they are 48 online and will be uh, uh, some more, inshallah, uh, among my friends uh, who like to understand and to to to, to get more uh, input about uh, Quran. Especially, uh, I'm inviting you today. One is basically for me to get more advice from you, especially uh, Sheikh Umar is my uh, teacher uh, on Quran. And uh, I used to know, uh, I get to know Sheikh Umar in 2008 and 2009. Yeah, when I accompanied my wife in LA, in Los Angeles, when my wife uh, studied in United, uh, University of Southern California, and I get to know Al Furqan Foundation. And at that time, Sheikh Omar, uh, with Al Furqan, and uh, I get to know that Sheikh Omar is uh, basically well versed in Quran, U.S. Is it right, Sheikh Omar? Yeah. yeah. That was in what year? 1994. 1994. Okay. So uh, the first graduate from Al Azhar, uh, Egypt, and today, uh, as the the first round uh, to. To introduce what are you doing, uh, what do you do right now, and how do you see uh, the, the, the uh, immediate uh, events, COVID-19, uh, impacting the Muslim world? Please, Sheikh Omar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Um, the duties of a Muslim uh, are essentially the same regardless of the situation. So I still have to do that with to non-Muslims. I still have to increase my Iman. I still have to uh, do the tasks that are uh, obligate to, uh, an obligation on us, uh, regardless of the situation. However, because you mentioned COVID-19 and where we are going, um, you know, obviously uh, these are events that have to do with the end of times. And it makes uh, one uh, section, uh, a whole section, in fact, of the sayings of the Prophet a little bit more clear. And I'm sure you have also heard these narrations because they're in Bukhari, Muslim, Ibn Majah, Nisai. They're all in the Kitab al, in the Kitab al Fitan in all of them. In which the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who's laying in the bed is better than the one who's sitting. The one who's sitting is better than the one walking. The one walking is better than the one who is running. So this is what seems to be where we're headed. And in the Ahadith literature, the general name given to this time period is Laylatul Mudlima, a dark night. Because at night, you know, you are stuck. Because you can't go out uh, because of COVID-19, because you might spread something or you might get something, or you can't go out because there is, uh, because of this situation of the lockdown, which the Prophet ﷺ specifically mentions in one of the sayings, uh, the narration uh, by Nu'aym bin Hamad specifically mentions that by the hands and the feet, meaning the hands is how this is what they tell you to wash, and feet is where you go somewhere. So by the hands of the feet, uh, a uh, a fitna will start that will take over the Ajam as well as the Arab, meaning the uh, the whole world. And uh, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that as a result, there will be one fitna after another fitna after another fitna, meaning one will lead to the other, will lead to another, will lead to another. So because of this lockdown, and the Prophet then said there will be a lockdown, people will be trapped. And it will go to the point where people will be so hungry because the economic, because it's a, more than a COVID-19 lockdown, it's an economic lockdown. And uh, if America is affected the most, then the whole world is affected by it. 
And at that time, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that uh, if someone comes to your house, don't fight him because, uh, and this is probably especially true in Muslim countries because somebody comes to your house, breaks in your house. The Prophet said, if you're in your house, go to your room. This is if you don't have an organized jama'ah to defend yourself. You've already been compromised in your house. What do you do? So it, in this situation, the pro, you know, because people are desperate and they're going to do what they have to do to feed their children. And so it seems like, uh, Allahu A'lam, I could be 100% wrong, but it seems like we are uh, going towards an economic collapse of some sort. And so we must learn how to survive uh, in this economic collapse by learning how to farm and learning how to grow food for ourselves, uh, learning how to uh, milk the cows or the goat, uh, and to be uh, to have a jama'ah, to be secure. Um, because the I think the economic meltdown, we, I mean, when I say we, I mean the intellectuals, essentially already knew this was coming. It was just a matter of when. And so this is the beginning of that time period uh, where uh, we will be dealing with a lot of uh, economic recession all over the world, but st starting from the top, America, and then it, it, it will affect the rest of the world. Um, and this will lead to uh, wars and more problems. Like, I'll give you an example. So they locked uh, everybody up, and uh, now they're slowly opening everything. But now the second wave of the COVID-19 is going up because everybody. And then if you have riots and all of that also happening as we're having in the U.S., then this is double, tripling the problem, especially economically, because the riots, they don't hurt the big stores. They don't hurt the Walmarts, you know. Or this, or the big, the mama papa stores, which is, you know, the backbone of the economy is these small stores, the the corner store stores, that are being looted, um, and so you have this situation where now that even that the stores are going to open up, they're going to open up, but they're going to have less customers, and and because they're going to have less customers because of the lockdown, less people have money, and everyone's going to only now a situation, you know, it's the politics of fear, or the fear is, the fear doesn't allow the economy to run naturally. This is why Allah says, Because you have to have two things to have a good economy, like Allah gave to Quraysh. Number one, well, three things. Number one, you must have trade routes. You must have access to trade routes. To the number two, you must ha be able to cultivate your own food, right? And zamzam is food, as you know from the Prophet So the water and the food that you get uh, gives you the the ability to then build from there. And uh, then you have your trade. Uh, you trade. And if you have political stability, you can trade. But if you don't have political stability and you're in a state of fear, no one's going to want to invest in a business where there's going to be war or where there's going to be riots or, or no one's going to put a million dollars on a corner store uh, thinking that maybe in five years from now, this store is not going to be here. So the United States was already in an economic uh, difficulty uh, from the perspective of the population. And uh, and uh, now uh, it is in more difficulties, much more difficulties. And so the government is not functioning. If you want to get your license, you can't get your license. If you want to get your passport, they're telling you it'll take six months. You know, so it's it's a pretty pretty dire situation. So I was mentioning the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which the Prophet said that there will be a tamuru. Uh, they, that they will come one uh, like one wave after another wave, the fitans, and it will be like a dark night. And uh, and the prophet said people will be locked in a lockdown. And now 
lockdown, whether it is because there is anarchy outside the house or or because it's just, it's going to spread the, the health situation or whether because uh, of, of, of other things, it could be wars. Uh, now you're stuck. Is, this is what the prophet said that at that time, because a person will have to begin by choosing, am I going to stay home and starve and trust Allah? Or am I going to go out? And because every every crisis also brings opportunity. Okay. And and so there is a lot of opportunity to make money out there, but it is in a very materialistic way. Uh, you know, this is a time where people are really hustling to sell drugs. Uh, this is a time where people are really hustling, making effort to sell uh, nudity and pornography and, and just the, the, all the negative things have become come outside in a situation where people are desperate. Now, I don't know what the situation is in Malaysia, but the situation in the U.S., uh, I mean, really, in some places, uh, there's no difference between Palestine and the U.S. at this point. Between because you have the population in some places that is not the minority in its true sense, like you have the blacks and the Hispanics, you have the minorities, and in the minority areas, these diseases and these problems are even more than in the suburbs right now. And so you have the city life that is being uh, far more affected. Uh, people are not traveling uh, as much. But how long it's human nature to leave the house, you know, so there's this. So as businesses open, they're going to be in a bigger they are in a bigger problem now as things are opening because it's people don't have the money and, and you've lost your clientele because the clientele went to people that were able to bring them the food to the house, which is not what normally the mama papa stores were doing. And so the big businesses uh you know the uh the bigger businesses are were able to uh and you know in america it's been one company after another company big names that have been filing bankruptcy prior to covid 19. meaning you know i'm sure you know the bookstore borders you you probably remember that they they got bankrupt right best buy got bankrupt and has refinanced itself but now like jc penny is is is, is filing for bankruptcy um and so a lot of these big companies so there's a big shift of wealth a big big shift of wealth happening in america and the poor are going to be more poor and the middle class because the one who is most affected is the middle class and the reason is the poor people are getting their checks from the government sometimes that check is more than what they were making and the rich people they're rich it doesn't matter to them there is a pause for six months or a year but the middle class, people that are making, you know, 40K to 100K, uh, they're the ones that are not going to be assisted by the government. And they are the ones that are not making enough. Because if you live in America, like you have, you know, most people are living month to month. You know, by the time you pay your rent or you pay your mortgage and you pay your car and you pay your insurance and you pay your daycare so you can go out and work. Uh, you're left with very little or uh, nothing savings or very little savings. And so that middle class that lives month to month, but lives comfortably month to month, right? That middle class is, is being affected the most in this whole situation. And we have essentially a situation now where uh, a, a, you could say a cold war or a soft war has started between the U.S. and China. And the reason is because the U.S. is blaming China essentially for this. And China is upset because China is blaming the U.S. because now the trade is shifting from China to India. So the, all, all the people that were trading from China, so all these interdependencies, America's, uh, China's biggest customer was, China's biggest customer was the United States. Well, they're not in good terms. So all, everything that used to come to the United States and the United States was dependent upon that cheap labor. So China was dependent upon America. America was dependent upon China, that relationship. And that was that, that's what created the global economy for, for a large part of it. So that interdependency is being challenged. And so the reason China is now having with 
problems with India is that China is building its own silk roads, its own routes. Okay, and these silk roads, uh, one of those silk roads is connected to a, ro a road called CPAC that's connected to Pakistan. And so China doesn't want that threatened in any way. So they have their military in the in the in that area where it's having conflict with with India. So you have now China actively looking to get away from the U.S. And uh, China thinks that America did this. America thinks that China did this. And, you know, I say one of the rules of politics is that if you are programmed to think of usual suspects, then it's probably not the usual suspects, uh, you know. So, like for example, a black, a black, a black in America, a black person in America might think, "Oh, I'm, it's the white person's fault that I'm in this situation," or vice versa. But these are the usual suspects. But sometimes, when it's a really big situation, uh, uh, like for example, the grave of Omar bin Abdul Aziz, what has happened? So the usual suspect is the Shia did this, and the Shia will say, "No." Uh, we didn't do this, but the usual suspects are the Shia, but the, it may not be just the usual suspects. There might be others who are taking advantage of that to create a situation of crisis. Anyway, so I was only referring to Sul Quraysh in the sense that Sul Quraysh uh, tells us the importance of what you need to have a stable economy. And one of the key elements is not to have fear. And one of the reasons that the world economy has been especially suffering after 9-11, because remember, in this riba system, yamhakullahu riba, Allah destroys riba, there have been many booms and busts, right? The system goes to a certain degree, then it busts. Then they recreate it, they give everybody the loans again, another set of loans to all the banks that happened in 2007, the melting crisis happened, then they have to reset, okay? Then it went... You know, and then now you have another boom. Now what they have to do is another reset. But this time the reset will be, uh, it won't be a cold reset. Uh, it will be a hard reset, I think. Allahu alam. Or it will lead to a hard reset. Thank you uh, so much, much uh, to enlighten for the first uh, first round, uh, talking about what happened in the United States and it will affect to the Ch to China, to India. So of course it will lead to Malaysia and Southeast Asia, of course, although at this moment, uh, probably that I, or basically myself, uh, don't feel uh, w like what happened in the, in the States, uh, because maybe uh, I'm not dealing with the big business, right, or I'm not dealing with the high, high ranking of leadership. But uh, when talking about what happened in the United States uh, in the COVID-19, about when you talk about riba just now, right? Uh, how does Muslim react, one? Uh, and the second thing, uh, talking about uh, the light, in the light of Quran and Hadith, uh, at this chaotic moment, uh, what Muslim in the States, one, and also people uh, like in Southeast Asia, maybe we are thinking uh, COVID-19 is controllable uh, at this moment, uh, about 100 uh, deaths uh, happen, uh, not more than 200. Uh, so we think, okay, we are in good shape. So what do you see, especially when we trying to understand based on the hadith, please. Uh, Bismillah, okay, so there are a few things, a few factors. Um, before I comment on the, the prophetic side, it all depends upon what treaties your country has with the United Nations. So if you have, uh, if the country has signed certain treaties with uh, the World Health Organization and the United Nations, so whatever, then they decide uh, which if I may say so, will prob probably be based upon the European and Western experience. And then they will expect all the countries to abide by whatever decisions that they make for those countries to be also be abided by the other countries. Uh, it also matters, it depends, Allahu A'lam now, it also depends what, because the economies again mostly are affected in the West, when they reset or whatever reset they intend to do, it will all depend upon uh, the, the, the resetting, how it will be. 
If the if the reset is har a hard reset, then it will severely affect uh, Malaysia and other other countries in Central Asia. Even though I have to say, probably it is logical to say that they will be the least affected. And that's another conversation, uh, because I think that uh, Malaysia has already been through economic uh, manipulation in the past. And I think that, uh, you know, certain things have been done to uh, keep that from happening again. So Malaysia might be in a better situation than uh, most uh, places, Allahu A'lam. But I can't comment on Malaysia too much only because, uh, you know, I have very, very limited knowledge about Malaysia itself. Now, as far as the, but the only thing I can comment on, it will depend upon the treaties and how willing Malaysia will be willing to go with those treaties or not go with those treaties to its benefit or to its detriment. Uh, now, as far as the teachings of the Prophet وسلم, are concerned, uh, again, the obligations Muslims owe uh, are the same, regardless of the situation. Uh, now, the, the thing I want to point out is this. Uh, something to think about, uh, that there is things that happen that cause problems in the long run. And I'll give you uh, a few, I can give you a few examples of that, inshallah, just uh, um, bear with me a little bit so that my point is clear. And then we'll come to other aspects if we have time to, of this, uh, of the sunnah or the, the, the prophetic model of how to, of, of what's happening, what we have to do. Uh, first, uh, I will say that the first and the most important thing a Muslim has to do is they have to get connected to the Book of Allah. Because we are about to, I think, uh, head into a situation where our Iman will be tested. This time period where I said people will be in lockdown and the Prophet said the person who is laying will be better than the person who is walking. Every single narration that talks about this, and I think there's more than 10, ends by saying that a person will wake up mu'min but go to sleep as kafir. And, or he will go to sleep as a, uh, you know, he, he will be mu'min at night, kafir in the morning, or vice versa. Every one of those narrations. So this will be a very, very, and there's a narration of Ali radiallahu anh that says this will be the most he said. You know how generally we have the impression that Dajjal is the greatest fitna. But there's one narration by Ali radiallahu anh. He says Laylatul Muslimah will be the most difficult because that will be the time where people's iman will be the most affected. Because when, you, and Isha'ulillah Muhaddis Dibli rahmatullahi he writes this in, in one of his books. He says that when people are in economic straits, they become like animals, right? And so uh, we are about to head into that situation. So we have to know what's the cure for that situation is number one, you have to be absolutely 100% convinced both in your heart and your mind that this is the truth. Islam is the truth. And you cannot let that be compromised. So this is the priority. In the fiqh, al in the fiqh of priorities, the fiqh is to preserve the iman. And in this time and age, there are generally, you can say, different ways to preserve Iman. In the past, it used to be that by having a religious experience. So I pray uh, salah every day, 50 salahs, 100 salahs. I create such an environment for myself, do so much adhkar, do so much salah, that it helps me see the unseen. And then that becomes a reality for me. So this is the traditional method that's been there, has been there, it is still there. That uh, your religious experience gives you a true dream or you have other religious experiences that show you this is haq, this is the truth. But this is not uh, as feasible for the modern man, for the working man. Because even if now you do dhikr, you do dhikr, you know, one hour, two hours maximum, you can't do dhikr like the people of the past, where they were literally doing adhkar for, you know, maybe half a day, 30% of their time. Uh, the modern world doesn't allow us to have that religious experience that they had in the past. The only other way is then you have a relationship with Qur'an and you build that. And you let Qur'an speak to you. And with your personal relationship with Qur'an. 
and then you will have that because if Allah can't convince you, nothing can convince you. So there are different levels of this. Of course, the basic level is you take the Quran if, and, and I will say to any Muslim from anywhere, your basic duty is that you have to at least know what the book of Allah says. Okay, And there are uh, th three levels of this. Three levels of this. Number one, uh, it's the practical aspect and the theoretical aspect of three. Okay, so the practical aspect is, you know, you pick up a translation, you take a pencil, and you start reading the translation. And everything you find interesting, you can circle it. Everything you find uh, doubtful, or what is this trying to say, or why does it say this, you underline it, and you find a Muslim who can answer that question for you. But you will find, in that experience, you will find that you learn to overall 99.99% .99 of the times you will learn to appreciate the Quran and you will find a certain change in yourself. This is the practical aspect. The theoretical aspect is the Quran is like an ocean which has the surface and then the deep, the depth of Quran. So, you know, the uh, example is uh, if I had a friend like Sheikh Ismail is my friend and he gave me some gift. And uh, then, you know, I didn't talk to him for several years. And let's say he gave me some special pen. And uh, I didn't talk to Sheikh Ismail for many years. And one day I see on my desk that pen. And that pen reminds me, oh, Sheikh Ismail, he's a friend of mine. Maybe I should call him, right? And so uh, then I'm all of a sudden reminded of something that was already within me. So this is the aspect of fitrah, the same way. That when you read the basic translation of Quran, the belief in Allah, the belief in the Day of Judgment, the belief in Risala, those things, those iman, basic aspects of fitrah, and those aspects of fitrah that are connected to iman, yet it's almost like you become, you're reminded, oh, look at the sky, oh, look at the history, oh, remember these are, this is how you should behave, and that you're answerable for what you do. It's almost like you discover something you knew but you just needed to be reminded of. So this, you could say in this, you can even use a translation, English translation or a translation of Quran in Malay language. This will bring out the basic knowledge, the a priori, you can say, the things that we already knew, they will become apparent to us in this process of reading the Quran. Then the second is, that you have a little bit, you know, this is why Allah says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِذِكْرِ for dhikr, for this level of, taz, of of dhikr, of being reminded of what? Of what's already there. And so at that level, the basic translation of Quran will also suffice. But more than that, if you have, you know, you have a master's degree, you have a, a bachelor's degree, you have a PhD in, in English language or some other subject, then you really don't have excuse for not trying to learn the Arabic language and not trying to build that relationship uh, with the Quran that it deserves. And for that, because then, it be, you know, translation anyhow uh, is never equal to the, the actual text, okay? And so the, the rhythm, the feeling, the words, the, the comprehensiveness of the words, the message is much more impact, impacting to the point where it can, at this level, the second, first is it can bring out the, the, the translation can bring out like reminding you of the things you already knew. But if you go to the second level, Quran can possess you. Its symbols will begin to become part of your thinking. You know, like for example, the way Quran uh, describes guidance, for example, Quran uses seven metaphors. One of the metaphors is the, of the agriculture or the tree, or even the word Jannah. Right? When you're thinking of good, you're thinking of Jannah. So these become part of your thinking process. And these metaphors, they affect how you think and how you process information. And so uh, you also have the metaphor of the business, for example. Uh, you have the metaphor from darkness into light, for example. So you, how you begin to start processing information will be really significantly uh, affected when you know the Arabic language. Okay, and that Quran will now begin to 
become part of you. It'll become part of your uh, your bones and part of your blood and part of your thinking. That nur will begin to be absorbed, you can say, by the process of osmosis almost. It'll become part of you at this level. And this is where every Muslim should really try to be. You know, if you are weak, you could start at level number one. But really, everyone should at least be here. Okay. Then the third level. And then if you have this, and then there is any fitna or there's any difficulty, then this, this second, not the first level, to, to withstand, to be like a tree that is not affected by the storms and the winds, to be that tree, you at least have to be at the second level. Second level. Second level. What's the difference between the first understanding a translation with uh, knowing... The practical effect is that in the first one, you're, you are you are convinced in your intellect, but you're not convinced in your mind. This is what Ibrahim والسلام, asked Allah, uh, How do you give life to the dead? And then so he believed. So there is the convincing of the mind, which has to do with shak. All right. And then there is the diseases of the heart, of, of the itminan of the heart, right? So when these two, when you are intellectually convinced and when you have comfort in your heart, there's no, there's nothing. Sometimes someone can be convinced intellectually. I think this is the truth. It makes sense. I believe there's God. I believe there should be a day of judgment. I'm convinced. But my heart's not agreeing with it. Or my heart agrees with it, but doesn't want to agree with it. There's, a con there's not nafs al mutma'inna. There's a nafs of, of conflict in you. Because why? Because of the, uh, the desires, the temptations, right? So you have the hawa that affects the heart. And you have the doubt that affects the mind. So with the basic going over the basic translation of the Quran, you can help a person remove the intellectual doubt, which is more important in a sense. Because uh, even when you look at the tartib of Quran, Quran starts with raib. Then fi qulubihim maradun. Then it goes to that, uh, where it talks about the munafiqeen. So uh, the Allah, you know, one of the shaykh said to me, uh, a very uh, interesting scholar. He said, like, Allah put the head on top and then the heart on the bottom. Right? And so, you know, even uh, some scholars have said that when we do ruku, it is like the sujood of the heart. And when we do sujood, it is like the sujood of your mind. Nasiyatin kadibatin khatiya. This, you know, this is the, the, the part that is the most uh, uh, important. But then this, if you want to be convinced where the storms of life and the crises of life do not shake you, then you, your heart has to be convinced too. Okay. And Shaulila uh, Muhaddas Dilmi, uh, he, uh, he says when your mind and heart are convinced together, then that is when, you know, you are now, you can have istiqama. Right. There's a level higher than that which is that you, it becomes your passion, it becomes your love. Because that, but for that to, you need, for, 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 for Allah and for the deen and for the prophet to become your passion, uh, you first have to have clearness of mind and clearness of the heart. That paves the way for uh, a passion and love. And um, anyway, so this is the second level. So in the one you are convinced in your mind, but if you want to attack the heart, the, the temptations of the heart uh, in, in a strong way, then you have to begin to absorb the Arabic uh, language into your thinking process in your heart. Shay Omar, uh, before you continue, uh, I believe that you mentioned just now uh, they are the third level, right? Yes. Okay. Before that, uh, maybe uh, you uh, can add more, but uh, talking about the between translation and also understand Arabic. So in in the, my case, basically, when uh, I'm going to deliver on TV uh, this Monday, uh, basically uh, the a little tadabur 
from Quran. So I uh, will share part of the understanding uh, based on translation, right? The literal meaning of the, the Quran. Uh, at least people will understand what's going on in uh, the first chapter, the second chapter, and so on and so forth. But then uh, how do I integrate so that uh, the, the content, which I will deliver one hour every day, uh, it will remove right uh, the shack just now, right? So basically uh, based on the first level. And also I can integrate also a little, although not, not that much Arabic, so that those who listen to the talk, uh, in we call it my Quran time, uh, they will uh, feel the Arabic, so they will taste the second level and then they are convinced and that will uh, maybe lead to the third level that we will mention. This, uh, advice. So there, in that, there are uh, two things. What I'm talking about is the personal relationship with Quran. But if you have a teacher who can transmit to you his feelings and his knowledge, even though it will be secondhand, but if somebody is, you know, if his balagha, his speech is good and eloquent and it can, you know, like the Prophet said, if somebody can talk in an eloquent way and in that eloquent talk, he's able to convey his experience. Then that person who is not even at the first level can be possibly getting the experience or partial experience of somebody even on the third level. Oh, okay. Okay, so it, it depends on uh, how much uh, convinced and possessed the communicator is and how much of that, how he is delivering that text to the minds and the hearts of the people before him. What is necessary is that the society has to have people at the third level. But the goal should be everyone should be at the second level. Mm -hmm. That should be the goal. But maybe more practical is everyone should be at the first level and people are able to convey the second and the third level. The third level is tadabbur, as you mentioned the word. Tadabbur is deep. Now, remember I said there's like an ocean in the surface of the ocean. Tazkir or, or dhikr is at like the surface. You're just reminded of the and then when you know the Arabic language, it's like you're diving into it a little bit. But the Dabbur is now you're diving deep into the Quran. And you're bringing out, you know, the Yaqut and Marjan and the gems of Quran. And you're showing the people, see, this is the beauty of Quran. This is the miracle of Quran. And this is the, you know, the, the, the uh, whatever you're trying to explain from Quran. Now you're able to deliver that experience. Like when you go in the ocean, as I was saying, when you bring out the gems, you can show everybody the gems. But you did the effort of diving in, getting the gems, and showing it to the people now. Now they will, they will, even though you have the experience, your experiences like at the level of Haqqul Yaqeen, because you dived into the ocean, you got the pearls. Now their experience will only be of, uh, of Ilmul Yaqeen or Ainul Yaqeen. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's this gap that's there, but however, it is still very powerful. So tadabbur, dubur means to go back. So tadabbur means to go back logically or by content or by seeing why this is so uh, basically diving deep. Okay. So you go, uh, you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and then you bring out these pearls and then you show them to the people. Okay. And the people, you will have uh, either uh Ainul uh, Yaqeen or Haqqul Yaqeen, but the people will definitely have either Ainul uh, Yaqeen or, or, or Ilmul Yaqeen as a result. So they are, they, those are the three levels of how to interact with the Quran uh, as the, the cure for the current situation in the world, right? This is the first thing. Mm -hmm. Is the pressure because the fitans that are coming, the one of the biggest problems of that is that it's going to challenge our iman. And so uh, the anecdote to that is going to be uh, is going to be uh, why the Quran, uh, because Quran uh, is uh, going to answer the questions that we have in our minds, uh, 
and convince us in our heart that that this is uh, more important than what our desires are. Because, you know, uh, from Sultan Mulk to Sultan Nas is all about the Day of Judgment. Okay. In fact, uh, according to uh, Mulla Farahi, when we talk about the Quranic groups and the, 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 the Nazmul Quran, the last group starts from Sultan Qaf to Sultan Nas. And this is all about uh, the Day of Judgment. The more you're convinced there's a Day of Judgment, the more you will be willing to change. Technically, it is not the belief in Allah that makes you change. Okay, there's Allah, I'm convinced. But what will cause me to change is وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّةً Right? وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَحَنْ نَفْسَ عَنِ الْحَوَى فَإِنَّ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ الْمَعْوَى So this, the fear of answering and the fear of accountability, this is actually key in, in change because then you have to see, okay, I want A, but if I don't, if I do A, then I'm in trouble in the long term. Then, then the more you believe in the long term consequences, the, then, you know, it's like in criminal psychology, they teach you that it's the benefit versus the risk, right? The benefit is immediate, uh, usually, versus the risk that you have to face long term. So if I know that uh, I'll go to jail for three days because I sold, stole a thousand dollars, well, that's not much of a risk, you know, because I can face three days of jail time for every thousand dollars I steal, it's no problem. But if you tell me that if I steal, you know, a thousand dollars and there's a chance I'm gonna lose my hand, well, now I have to really assess the, the risk versus the benefit. And so uh, this is kind of what Quran does. Quran puts the reader in a situation where the risk is absolute. Right? The risk is absolute versus the benefit is very temporary. And Quran makes this picture very clear that, you know, you, you are kind of a silly person if you're going to. So you get my point that uh, what uh, why Quran uh would be very effective in, in changing a person. When you mentioned about uh, Nazmul Quran just now uh, from Sheikh Farahi, right? So yeah. uh, <coughs> uh, the, the grouping is uh, interesting. And can you elaborate more on how, uh, if I want to share with public, uh, which uh, what emphasis that I need to give because I will deliver from page to page. So for uh, for each individual, they want to read from one page to another, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when I'm as a uh, the, the presenter, I want to share with them uh, what aspect that I need to emphasize so that each page uh, will lead to the strengthen of iman uh, in myself and also the audience. So there are a few things in Quran that we can um, uh, look at. I don't know if I'm going to answer your question properly. And if I don't, you can ask me again and I can come at it from a different perspective. As far as uh, the Muslims are concerned, the Quran has two tartibs or two arrangements. One is the arrangement of revelation. As it came, starting with Iqra and then going till the ayat of uh, and then there's the tartib of the mushaf, the arrangement of the mushaf. Now, the arrangement of the mushaf is for the ummah. And it has been arranged in a way that benefits the ummah. And no other arrangement would have been better than this arrangement. So, for example, as you know, Fatiha was not the first surah. But now Fatiha is the first surah. Fatiha meaning the opening. Yeah. So it starts, you know, the, it's almost like the index of the Quran. What will, what are the contents of this Quran is, you can say Fatiha is in the form of a dua, which is a very beautiful example. And uh, in the form of a dua saying, okay, what is, who is this book for? What is his, what is his yearning? What is his cry? What is his fears? What 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 you know what is his question to allah so this is where you need to be mentally 
Then now Quran, and you ask for guidance. Now the rest of Quran is answered to Fatiha. So Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ So this is how it starts. Now in this, the grouping is very important. Now, Mawlana Farahi, the way he has looked at the coherence of Quran, he's looked at the, he's looked at the groupings of Quran or the groups within Quran. Now, each group consists of Makki and Madani surahs. Okay. And uh, he basically uh, looks at, okay, what, how is, how is the Quran organized? And the reason he does this is because uh, by the time of Imam Suyuti, uh, uh, there was a big discussion among scholars. Are the ayat in, in Nazam or are the, meaning do the ayat have coherence? Or because when generally, sometimes someone reads the book of Allah and it goes from one topic to the next topic, to the next topic, to the next topic. Actually, I'll spend some time explaining this. So this become this point needs to be clear. A few things that Mona Farahi says are very, very important. And I think this has not been conveyed properly to the uh, to the Malay uh, community to benefit from his thought. I think I will mention a few things. Number one, you know, uh, I, can, I, I don't know what is a good example in your case, but I'm going to give the example of the case that works for us in America, is that when the president gives his presidential State of the Union speech, he's talking to many audiences. He's talking to the people of his party. Then at next sentence, he might be saying something that's addressing his opposition party. And then next, uh, he's talking to uh, another group, but he doesn't mention who the group is. He doesn't mention who the audience is. It's understood because it's a speech. Uh, he says, uh, like I can say, I can say, for example, someone, uh, there's, a, there's a group of people uh, that, uh, that deny hadith, right? It's understood who they are. That might be a particular organization or a particular person or a particular represent. It's understood in the conversation. For example, if I say in the conversation, look, the Quran and Hadith go together. I'm just saying. It's understood that I was talking about or I was referring to people that deny Hadith of the Prophet Right? So the Quran is like a, sta a speech in which the audiences are changing from one to the next, to the next, to the next. The speech is coherent. The problem is that we are unaware of who the audiences are, when and where. This is a little bit different than Asbab al-Nuzul. This ayah was revealed in this occasion, this ayah was revealed in this occasion, this ayah was revealed in this occasion, and these ayat or this surah was revealed in this occasion. That's there. But that has to do with the tartib of the nuzul of the Quran. The, so by the time of Imam Sayyuti, it became a big discussion. That uh, are these uh, verses of the Quran, they are coherent or they're just in, just in, the, in the form the Prophet taught us. It's uh, tawqifi, the Prophet said it, so it's there, that's it. Or is there an arrangement to the Quran? And this, for the scholars, they had different opinions. Some said, no, 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 it doesn't need an arrangement. It is uh, not having coherence. And uh, some said, no, 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 the Quran must have coherence. The book of Allah is the book of Hikmah. It must have coherence. Imam Sayyuti was of the opinion that the Quran has coherence in it. It has Hikmah in it, in its arrangement. But many other scholars said no. But when the, 21st, the 20th century came, the 19th century came, the Orientalists started to study the Quran. And they started to look at the Quran. And they started to question the Quran. And one of the biggest things that they were saying was, your book, your Quran, your book of guidance, like if you read the Bible, it's very clear, it's a historical process. Starting with Genesis, the beginning of creation, and then history from here and here and here. You can follow the history, and it's very, very simple. Even though the Quran does that in some occasions, like in Sutul Yusuf, Allah adopted that style of chronological order, okay? <coughs> but most of the Qur'an is not like that. And so, when the non-Muslims, the Orientalists, they read the Qur'an, they were like, you know, this book doesn't make much sense. It's talking about one thing and it's talking about another thing. And so, uh, Mona Farahi and other scholars began to think about, okay, 
does the Quran have any coherence? Does the Quran have uh, a uh, a coherence? And uh, the example that I will give is like "Fala uqsimu bi in najum." Allah says, "No, I swear by the places of the stars." When you look at the stars, you may think that oh, the stars are just random. You know that they don't have uh, any coherence to them, and then there's no uh, there's no system to 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 the stars. But when you start living in the desert and you start learning, okay, th this star will lead you in this direction, and this star will lead you in this direction, and in this season you will see this star, and in the other season you'll see this star, and now all of a sudden the map of the sky that did not look very coherent with just random stars, all of a sudden you begin to see, wait, there is a coherence to this, right? So Allah says, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ I swear by the occurrence. Waqa'a means to occur. Interestingly enough, waqa'a also means sakata. Sakata means to sink. So the sinking of the stars is the black holes. And the occurrence of the stars, so both ways, it's interesting. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُومِ إِنَّهُ قَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ Allah says, if you did but know, this is a great oath that I'm taking. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ This is a very noble Qur'an. And, you know, it has coherence just like the stars. If you study the stars, it'll have coherence. But you don't see it when you just look in the sky. Apparently, you don't see it. But if you actually study it, you begin. the more you study it, the more you will see the coherence in it. Right? And, and if you just look at it from far away, if you're a first-time looker, you'll be amazed looking at the sky. The way you will be amazed looking at the sky, you're amazed looking at the Quran, even for the first time, the, the level one I was talking about, right? Even he will be amazed at the content because it'll it's not content that's far away from him. It's content that's already in him. You mean with the translation? Level. The translation yes. At the level of translation, it's like you're looking at the sky for the first time. Things are there, but they don't necessarily make that much sense. But there's still light. There's still guidance. Right, and there's still something that have to do with you, right? And so, uh, so I was only saying that uh, when uh, Orientalists looked at the Quran and they said, "Wait, this book doesn't seem to make very much sense." So, in response to that, the scholars of Islam seriously started to study the coherence of the Quran. What is the? What is the? Is there a way of coherently understanding Quran? And in that, I would say probably the most significant contribution was done by Mona Farahi. And the first thing, one of the first points he makes in this is that we usually compare Quran to poetry. Even though the Quran says, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَعِرِ But this is not the word of a poet. So he says, actually, the Quran is more properly in the form of a khutbah. If you think of each of, especially uh, uh, each surah as a khutbah, you will be better able to understand its content than if you're looking at it in comparison to poetry or some rhyme or rhythm like that. Because that will explain to you why the Quran is moving from one topic to the next topic. Because when you give a khutbah, you're talking about one thing, then another thing, even though the audience understands it's all connected. In the context of the situation it is being delivered in. But not if you read that same lecture 200 years later, you might see this is very disoriented, this is very disorganized lecture because you don't understand the, the geopolitical situation that people were probably dealing with. So, in the same way, the Quran is more in the form, this is why we say it's the kalam of Allah, right? This is the this is the kalam of Allah, meaning the speech of Allah. It's in the form of a khutbah. And what are the qualities of a khutbah? And as you know, uh, we have the uh, the poet of the Arabs is very popular. And the sabah mu'allaqat and so on and so forth. But is also what is very popular, but not as popular, is the khutbat of the Arabs. The, uh, the, they used to also give khutbahs. And this was also something that was part of their custom. And uh, I forget right now, one of the uh, grand, great grandfathers of the Prophet, I think the great grandfather of Abdul Muttalib, he actually started the idea of giving khutbahs and giving 
like uh, I don't remember if he used to do it every Friday or not, but he used to give gather the people and give khutbas on ethics. And this was done by uh, one of the great grandfathers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the uh, probably the Sunnah of Ibrahim or something like this. Anyway, the point I'm trying to say is that when you give a khutbah, what are the qualities of a khutbah? So the qualities of the khutbah are the beginning and the end are extremely strong. When you have the introduction and your concluding remarks, they're extremely strong. Just like the Quran, you'll notice the surahs, the beginning and the endings are particularly strong. And in the middle is the message that you're trying to convey. But in some way, as shape or form, it is attached to the first and the last part of the surah. Okay. And uh, the second quality of the Quran is, and this is just for, uh, for, for, for you to kind of get an idea of how this khutbah works. How do you know that the topic has moved from one place to another place? One easy way is when the rhythm changes. Okay. When the rhythm changes, the topic, it's like a new paragraph. So like, for example, uh, uh, this is one asloob, one tartib, one rhythm. You can see this is a little bit different. Another example I'll give you. Alif la mim, thalikal kitabu la rayba fi. All the way till wa ulaika ala hudam mir rabbihim wa ulaika humul muflihun. This is one rhythm, but very, very different. In a ladina kafaru sawa una alayhim a anzar dao am lam tundihum la yu minun. Hatam allahu ala kulubihim. This is a very different rhythm, very different tarannum, uh, you can say. Right? The, the rhythm, when the rhythm changes, the topic changes. When the topic changes, the audience changes or the situation changes. So, this uh, are so some of the things that uh, uh, when uh, Mona Farahi, he uh, studied the Quran, he realized or he came up with a system of understanding what is the coherence of Quran, okay? And so, like I said, every group you can say has Makki and Madni. So they're like, like the first group, for example, is with Al-Fatiha and from Fatiha, the first four surahs, Surah Al-Baqra, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, and Surah Al-Ma'idah. Okay, so Fatiha is Makki, you can say. Uh, and then the rest of the four are Madni. Then after that, the next surah, Surah al I believe Surah Al-An'am, right? Uh, Surah Al-An'am. And then the second group is Surah Al-Tawbah. So if you just take these two groups, for example, this will help you uh, understand uh, how the Nazam works. So, uh, in the first group, you have one Makki Surah Fatiha. And then the Tartib of that is like this. So, you have four Surahs. In the four Surahs, you have the following. You have Baqarah, which is primarily addressing the Jewish community. And you have Al Imran, which is primarily addressing the Christian community. But after addressing the Jewish community in Surah Al-Baqarah, after the, the change of the Qibla, this is, you could say, this is the, uh, after Allah says, I gave you manna and salwa, and I gave you this, and I gave you this, and I gave you this, and you did this, and you did this, then finally it is, okay, the Qibla is going to be changed. And then the new Sharia starts. And the rest of Surah Al-Baqarah is on the Sharia. So the Jewish community is dealt with in Surah Al-Baqarah. Then in Surah Al-Imran, you have the Christian community being addressed. But instead of talking so much about Sharia, Surah Al-Imran talks about the spirit of Islam, the ruh that's in that law. Right? وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوبِ وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ So like this, you have the spirit of Islam being discussed. You have the jihad being discussed. You have uh, Badr being discussed. Then you have, uh, so the Christian community is discussed in Surah Al-Baqarah. The Jewish community is discussed. And also, mind you, the Jewish mind 
is a, is a historical, looks at things from a historical perspective. Surat so al-Baqarah addresses things from a historical perspective. The Christian mind is very much like an, an analogies and parables and tamthilat and examples. So Allah says, look, the example of Isa is like the example of Adam, right? And uh, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the mindset of those particular people to address those people. And then you have Sutta Nisa, again, which is a, a continuation of the law of the Sharia. Because remember, I said this is tartib based upon the Ummah. So for the Ummah, there are two things that it has to know. Number one, who should I be careful of? Who are going to be my enemies? And who's going to try to hurt me? And number two, what is Allah? What is this Islam? What is What am I required to do? And when we talk about law and the spirit of the law together, we're talking about especially at the social level, the social and, and, and all of these rules that it, what is the rules I have to live by? So you have from Baqarah to Surat Al-Ma'idah, you have the Sharia, most, the blueprint of the Sharia being given to you. This is how you have to live. This is Islam. At the same time, you're being told, okay, but you do have enemies that are going to try to hurt this blueprint and this lifestyle and this milla of yours. So the Quran starts with, give me guidance. But Quran says, don't make me and as you know, this is like from the hadith of the Prophet, don't make me like the Jews and don't make me like the Christians. So you have Baqarah talking about the Jewish, the Bani Israel, and then you have uh, Ali Imran talking about the Christians. Okay, so you have this symmetry in the Quran. Okay, so now let's move on to the second group. The second group is very interesting. Because it is specific to Prophet Muhammad And that is that uh, every Prophet has to, every Rasul, me and my messengers, we have to prevail. And that will happen in one of the two ways. Either you reject the messenger, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his sunnah is, if you reject Nuh, if you reject Lut, if you reject uh, Hud, you will be eradicated. And this is what Makkah was being told. If you don't believe in the Prophet, if you finally don't accept his message, you will be finished. This also is indicated, for example, in when the Prophet went to Ta'if and the angel came to him. Or, for example, Sa'ala Sa'ilun bi'adhabin waqi'ah. Some scholars hold the opinion that this was the Prophet asking Allah, but Allah said, no, give more time. But anyway, that's a separate issue. The uh, Surat Al-An'am and Surat Al-A'raf are Makki Surahs. And then uh, you have, uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, uh, the, tar uh, the tartib uh, is, is losing my mind right now. You have Surat Al-An'am, Surat Al-A'raf, then Surat Al-Anfal, and then Surat Al-Tawbah. Surat Al-Tawbah. And this is the second group. Two Makki, two Madni. Makki is talking about the warnings of Makkah. You better believe or else. And the realization of that starts from Badr, Yawmul Furqan. And the completion of that ends with Tawbah. Whereas Fatul Makkah, the Prophet enters as a crownless king into, into Makkah. And he is now victorious. And that promise that was given to the Prophet that he will be victorious. Either he will have victory or they will be eradicated. Right? Now, so the Tawbah says what? Arba'atu Ashhirim. You have four months, siru fil ardi arbatu ashhar, right? And you have four months to decide now whether you accept the. And this is specific to the Prophet. When the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have been commanded to fight the people. This is specifically to whom a messenger of Allah is sent, and they have no choice but to accept his call or face eradication. Okay. So this is what's happening in Surah Tawbah. So the Tawbah is basically an announcement. Bara'atu min Allah. Allah is free now from all of the treaties you've made, except for the treaties that are already made. Now there's no compromise. You have to now accept Islam. Otherwise, you're done for. And you have four months to decide what you want your fate to be. Okay? So starting with 
the warnings of of this in Sutul Anam and Sutul Araf, and the beginning is the first battle, Badr, and the ending of this is the Fatul Makkah. Ida Jaa and the and the and the uh, the uh, the you can say the declaration made in the first ten ayat of Sutul Tawbah and what follows after that. Uh, and uh, all this is there of the of the Prophet وسلم, the promises he was given by Allah have now come to a completion. So this is now the second group. Okay, so these two groups will give you an example of how the the overview of the coherence is. Okay, and so uh, yeah. So I don't know if uh, you want me to explain more. Also, another thing that's very interesting here uh, is that most of the surahs in Quran are in pairs. And in order to understand one surah, you need to understand the other surah and how they are in pairs. So I gave a slight example of Baqarah and Al Imran, how they come together as a pair. So, <clears throat> you know, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the, the surahs being in pairs. The Prophet said, uh, the, Allah, the Prophet of Allah gave Bakra and Al Imran a name, a Zahrawain. These, you know, these two surahs are Zahrawain. The last two surahs, Mu'awazatain. Okay. Right? And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have become old because of Sutul Hud and its sister surahs. So you find that most of the surahs in Quran, they are also in pairs. So using these pairs to understand one another, the one surah to the other surah, and how they come together to complete a topic. Uh, a very, uh, uh, I, I can give you two, three examples of a very good example of these pairings within Quran. Uh, a very good example would be Rahman and Waqia. Very easy to explain examples. So what Sutra Rahman starts with, Sutra Waqia ends with. And what Sutra Rahman ends with, Sutra Al-Waqiyah starts with. So, for example, it is known that Sutra Rahman ends with two levels of Jannah. Wali man khafa maqama rabbihi jannatan. And then, wali, uh, wa min dunihi ma jannatan. Okay. And then Sutra Al-Waqiyah uh, uh, starts with, as-sabiqoon as-sabiqoon. Then, uh, wa ashabu al-yamini ma ashabu al-yamini. Then, ashabu al-shimal. Over there, you have the then you have the people of the hellfire. Then uh, Sutra Rahman talks about uh, the creation of Allah and the day of judgment. Over there, then you have that. Then the Sutra Rahman uh, starts with Ar-Rahman wa Allam al-Quran, and you have Sutra Al-Imran extending that so a little bit about the Quran specifically. So you have these Sutra Rahman, and the aslub is different. In Sutra Rahman, Allah is relatively nice. And Waqia is a little bit harsh. We did this or you did this? We sent down the rain or you sent down the rain? You know, you did this or we do this? This asnub is a little bit more harsh, but you can see these two come to together as a pair. Another example, very simply, people understand it. Sutul Muzammil and Sutul Mudathir. Ya yuhal Muzammil, Ya yuhal Mudathir. Over there is Ya Yuhal Muzammil Qumil Layla Illa Qalila. Over there, it's talking about the Prophet's personal relationship with Allah. Over there, it's talking about over there again, Ya Yuhal Muzammil Qum. Over there, Ya Yuhal Mudassil Qum. So you have these similarity of uh, words, but this is talking about the risala of the Prophet, his his life in the daytime, and then his life in the nighttime, right? So this is about the date. So these two come together as a pair. Another very beautiful example is Sutul Bani Israel and Sutul Kahf. Over there is Subhanallah. Over there is Alhamdulillah. Over there is Asrabi Abdihi. He took a servant up. Over there is Alhamdulillah. He brought the book down. So over there is about the Prophet. Over here is about the book of Allah. Right? Then Sutul... Uh, both surahs end with Quls. Qul udullaha awud rahman ayyama tad'u falahu al-asma'ul husna. Over there you also have Qul. Law kan al-bahru midha the kalimatil. Right? And then Qul innama ana basharum. The last ayah in Sutul Kahf. 
and then قل الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا so you have two quls you have subhanallah alhamdulillah the coming down of the book going up of the servant of allah and in this way the rest of the themes they're intermixed into one another so mona farahi also understood that the surahs they most of the surahs of quran they are in the form of pairs so there's this overall grouping of the seven groups that i talked about and <clears throat> then after that within those groups then there are some of these surahs they are in the form of kashish pairs yes so basically uh, Shri Omar, uh when you mention i get really clear uh, about uh, get the public to have translation the first stage right the second one is to understand arabic and the third one to do the tadabbur and basically when you mentioned about nazmul quran just now pairs and also uh right in surah al-isra but israel uh, talking about subhanallah here alhamdulillah and so on and so forth that is considered uh the third level of tadabur right so that would be tadabur tadabur and that is so basically... that's one aspect so that is quran within quran okay but so you can basically... also have for example the relationship between quran and tahlik mm -hmm. or uh, uh quran and the social sciences ah Right, so, so all of these, the Quran within Quran, Quran within the social sciences, Sanurikum ayatina fil afaq, takhliq, wa fi anfusikum, the social sciences. Okay. Hatta yatabatin annahu al-haq. So basically when we are trying to do tadabbur, uh, Quran with Quran, Quran with akhliq, with makhluk, right? Uh, social scientists, uh, we're talking about psychology, about biology, chemistry, and all different knowledges. Uh, that is the tadabur that uh, need to be presented to the audience so that they can have the ainul yaqeen or uh, uh, the right. ainul yaqeen, right? Yes, absolutely. Because this is the point of the these ayat being more and more ayat being displayed, newer ayat being displayed. We may not be able to appreciate the sun because we always found it to be there. Because okay. you see, when you had an agricultural society and not the modern society, you appreciated the seasons and the sun and how it affects everything around you. You had more. Pre Nowadays, we just assume it's the same as the bulb. The sun is the same as the bulb in my room, just a bigger bulb. But so now you need to show them more ayat, different ayat that they did that that resonates with them more immediately. Uh huh. So uh, when I try to relate uh, these three stages, uh, of course, the Arab in the time of Prophet Sallallahu they don't really need translation because uh, they understand Arabic, right? Right. So they... The and, was number two. Number two. So uh, Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi will bring them uh, number three. Yes. Because uh, it, was a, it was the miracle of the Quran itself. Mm-hmm. You know, the message of Quran and Quran is opening up their secrets. Quran is, you know, uh, uh, telling them what happened in a certain situation. And the Quran is giving them guidance that their fitrah says, oh, wow, you know, bayinatim al huda, right? So it was very clear uh, uh, what uh, the miracle, the miraculousness of the Quran was very clear to that particular community. I just want to get um, a clarification on, okay, let's say, uh, Surah Al-Kaf or Surah Yasin revealed to uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the audience, basically the public in Mecca or in Medina will listen to the Quran, right? Yes. Do they need uh, explanation from Prophet to understand the third level, Tadabur just now? Or they are Arab that just can understand directly from the revelation? Both depending sometimes they were confused also with quran mm -hmm. but they weren't confused uh, it, it's i'll give you an example um there are let's say give and take 6666 ayat in quran but i'm I, i'm not necessarily convinced uh, directly of all 6666 as a direct experience as an experience maybe out of the 6000 some ayat 400, 500 are ayat that I directly relate to as my experience that this is the truth. 
okay? So, for example, uh, even for anybody, uh, you know, the Quran itself talks about ayatul mutashabiyat, alif lam mim. That's not a direct experience of a miraculousness to any particular individual. But a few of the ayat in Quran that I can point to and say, this ayah, look at this ayah. This is miraculous. And because I know this is miraculous, therefore the rest of the whole book is miraculous. I just don't understand the rest of the miraculousness as well as I can personally feel this miraculousness. Right? So, uh, so even when the companions of the Prophet were confused about an ayah, they were still not confused that this is the book of Allah in a sense. It was still a tremendous experience for them. Yeah. Uh, as 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 a process, it was an, a tremendous experience for them. So basically, the more they interact with more verses, they will experience more, right? Yes. And for them, one of the miraculous things was, was uh, is that it the ayat were coming down according to a situation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the ayat are telling them what the munafiqin are really thinking. The ayat are talking about, uh, like for example. Uh, when the ayah comes down about the wives of the prophet with the situation with the honey, right? Yeah. So that's a person that's like, oh, okay, Allah said that is okay, fine. Or the prophet gave a secret to his wife and then she gave it to other people. So this is the ayat of Allah telling you what the situation is. The ayat of Quran is telling you that that masjid is a masjid dirar, right? And so people are seeing, okay, the Quran is exposing everything, right? And so that so in, even though they may, some of the companions may not be sure or a little bit confused, what does this mean, uh, this ayat mean? But the overall experience was miraculous. Okay, so if I can conclude uh, um, based on my understanding, uh, they take time to understand uh, more uh, miraculous, miraculous, miracle of Quran, and they, uh, yeah, they take time. And then at the same time, uh, that miraculousness, mi miracleness. Okay, I, I try to pronounce it. Uh, it's different from one individual to another, right? Yes. So that is what we can call religious experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can read an ayah, "Khalaq uh, al-insana min alaq." Somebody can read that, and it doesn't mean anything to them. But I can read it and say, oh, wow, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, so the religious experience will be different based upon uh, my uh, education, my background, my content of understanding things. Uh, uh, so like this. So, yeah. OK, so that's a uh, nice thing to, to over, over here. You can say that, uh, again, there are. Uh, if you divide knowledge into uh, two types, meaning I'm talking about uh, there's the knowledge of the hard sciences, biology, physics, and mm -hmm. chemistry. Yeah. Biology, physics, and chemistry, these are ayat of Allah. Okay. And then there is the social sciences, psychology, sociology, political science, economics, history, law, these. This is where you need guidance. This is the subjects that need hadaya. Ah, okay. Okay, these are the subjects of hadaya. Islam is not concerned with your knowledge of chemistry and biology in as much as they are ayat of Allah. That's there. What is their function is ayat of Allah. But what you do with it, you make a watch with that knowledge, you make some medicine with that knowledge, you uh, discover some herbs that will cure somebody with that knowledge. This knowledge is the science, the, the hardcore science of physics, biology, and uh, physics, biology, and uh, uh, chemistry. This is common to all human beings. Yeah. Okay. And so they discovered the fire, then they discovered the wheel, they discovered medicine, they discovered this. This is common to all of humanity. Okay, this uh, this is the collective knowledge of mankind. Muslim, non-Muslim, doesn't matter. It's the collective knowledge. And this is man is, is, is uh, you can say, it is in the nature of man that this knowledge will always increase. The knowledge of these three subjects will increase 
and we use these three to make technology and then technology will increase okay but where man is lost and where he needs revelation where he needs guidance guidance because we don't need guidance in chemistry the process is very simple either you discover something by mistake which happens very often or you use trial and error you try one thing and you discover it's not right so you try something else and you say okay this is not right you try something else and you say okay this worked and then man discovers that and then now it becomes the property of man and then he goes on to the next thing okay but guidance is something that man is not in a position to give himself because oh. of the the contradictions within what i mean by that is who is going to tell you what is right male or female male will always side with himself female will always side with herself who is right the capitalist or the or the labor worker the one who is investing in the business he will say look it's my money i invested it i have the time i'm taking the risk i'm doing everything it's my right labor will worker will say look i'm the work we're working day and night uh, to make this all happen i should have more rights right you have the same thing between the individual and the collective where do you draw the line of uh, between the male and the female the individual the collective the uh, the, uh, the 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 capital the investor rather i should say and and the and the worker uh, where do you draw the line who's going to draw this line the lines of rights and the balances between these so and then uh so the social science is what i'm trying to say it tries to determine these fine lines but man has not been able to do that okay and so the purpose of revelation is to guide man in these subjects in social science in the social sciences okay so uh Shay omar uh, when you mention about uh ayat uh, so that we can appreciate uh, allah uh, we've had a science, right? Yes. And uh, basically, when we get the hidayah, we are appreciating Allah to guide us in social science. Right? Primary. And, primary. and the role of the sciences is to give you ayat. Yeah. Even though they're also ayat, fi and pusikum is also ayat, but they also need guidance. So their guidance with ayat. And this is why Allah says, Shahar Ramadan, Alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran, Hudan lil-nas wa bayinati min al-huda. How you have to live your nice life and the proof, this is how you have to live your life, is bayinati min al-huda. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Shaykh Omar. Uh, we probably uh, already gone uh, one hour and 15 minutes um, beyond the time uh, we I plan to be only one hour and hopefully uh, this uh, will benefit to the audience who are listening right now 56 uh, audiences uh, online and sure. inshallah hopefully um, do you mind if this kind because one of the the, the, the uh, comment here without um, Okay, uh, this is from uh, Sister Faiza Sanib, uh, I believe from Singapore. Uh, please have more sessions like this. Yeah, so uh, hopefully that we can have more, especially I'm, I'm keen to, uh, if you can enlighten more about the, the function of Al-Quran, uh, Huda, Bayina Timina Huda, Wal Qur'an, and also another verse to explain what does it mean uh, in our daily life, in our practical life 2020, especially when you are talking about the COVID-19, uh, how uh, Huda will help the, the current Muslim, Bayina uh, Timnal Huda, and also Al-Furqan, what kind of practical response when somebody get the Furqan, but not in this session, hopefully uh, we can schedule another session and Absolutely. you can uh, share uh, with more inshallah is it possible absolutely inshallah inshallah thank you so much Omar, for your time today and uh, i'll text you uh, to to schedule for next session and hopefully this will benefit for me uh, especially because uh, i need to learn more to uh, and being advised especially when i'm going to uh, share with uh, more people on tv uh, for 604 sessions okay uh, it is 
a big task, but uh, I believe uh, based on uh, the, 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 the little knowledge uh, I learned from you and also several other uh, teachers, hopefully that will benefit and um, benefit to the, to the audience, inshallah. Please make dua for me. Yeah, absolutely, inshallah. May Allah give you all the success. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Omar. Uh, maybe a one minute conclusion for the rest of the audience, please. Uh, Bismillah. Um, basically, uh, I think my main point today was that uh, in the times to come, in the difficulties to come, even though our obligations to the Quran and to the deen are always the same, but even more so now, more than ever, we have to focus on Quran because Quran is that one thing, whether you have your friends, you have your, even sometimes we listen to lectures on, on, on YouTube, you know, you're listening to scholars, that's all great. But if you have that relationship with the book of Allah and that direct relationship with Allah, and you have that direct knowing that this is the truth through your experience of your engagement of the book of Allah, then that is what's really going to make you like a strong tree that no matter what wind is blowing or what storm is coming, you will be unshakable, inshallah ta'ala. And then that is that is really what we need right now. We need iman, not iman that's blind. Somebody can be born Muslim and have strong iman, but he doesn't know why he has that iman. It's a process of socialization, cultural. Culturally, you have the iman. We need people with basira, iman with basira. Qul hadihi sabili, say this is my path, adu ilallah. The Prophet was told to say, I call towards Allah, how? Ala basiratin, with full insight, ana wa man Me and those who follow me, they're not blind followers. They're followers with full insight, full understanding of what they're getting into and what is, if this is the truth or not. They're not just blindly following. The problem is, we have Muslims with a lot of iman, a lot of iman, a lot of iman. But that iman itself is blind. It doesn't have an intellectual aspect to it. To get that intellectual dimension, to get that basira that is needed for this day and age, you have to engage with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you so much uh, for the conclusion. Uh, we need to build iman based on basira. Uh, the real knowledge, the real commitment convinced uh, in our heart. And inshallah, perhaps uh, in a future session, we will talk about, we can discuss uh, about uh, Hidayah, about Huda, uh, uh, and also Bayinati Minal Huda Wal Qur'an, and also another term, terminology related to what's the function of our Qur'an, because uh, you mentioned just now, Qur'an will bring religious experience uh, which is so personal, so individual, based on background and so on and so forth. But uh, I believe that topic will be so interesting to be discussed in the next session, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله